Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Heritage Talks Online. My name is Heather Darch, and I'm here with Glenn Patterson, and we are project directors for the Quebec Anglophone Heritage Network, also known as Quan. We are really pleased to welcome you to our series called Dreaming Big, inspiring stories from across Quebec's heritage community. In this series, we're exploring inspiring stories from Quebec's historical societies, museums, archives, community organizations, and cultural groups, whose vision has had a lasting impact on the history and heritage of Quebec. Quan is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to preserve and promote the history and heritage and culture of Quebec. You're welcome to become a member of Quan, and membership is open to everyone, including community groups and heritage organizations. So please check out our website at qahn.org for more information. Membership gives you access to all sorts of programs and workshops, heads up on new publications that are coming out, projects that are going on across the network, and also to our quarterly magazine called Quebec Heritage News. And this is a great magazine filled with articles and stories, pictures, poems, uh, advertising about events that are coming up. And it features all kinds of stories. For example, this week, this month features uh, Montreal's Black Borders by Dr. Dorothy Williams. And then there's articles on Chateauguay Valley Square Dancing and shoe, shoe, uh, um, in the Sherbrooke Snowshoe Club. So all sorts of articles, and it's really great to have. And so this is what you get with your membership and also access to a really great community and network right across the province. For first time new members, you can take advantage of a 30% discount promotion for a one year membership. That's $20 for one year. But you have to act quick because the promotion is only valuable during the actual presentation this evening. So if you're interested in becoming a member and becoming a part of our great network, you can send us a message on Facebook Live that you're interested. Or if you're on Zoom tonight, you can use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Just let us know that you're interested and we'll tell you what to do next. I would like to thank our funders who helped make this program possible, including Canadian Heritage, the Chalkers Foundation, the Zeller Family Foundation, and the Townshippers Foundation. Thank you very much. All of our programs are recorded and you can go to Heritage Talks Facebook page if you'd like to see past presentations or if you'd like to see what's up and coming in the series. Um, you don't have to have a Facebook page of your own. It's a public site. So you can just go to the Heritage Talks Facebook page and find all of the, the projects and all of the presentations that have gone on before. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Glenn, for just a minute. He's going to tell you a little bit about what we hope you're going to be doing while our speaker is talking and then what comes after. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Heather. Welcome, everyone. Um, so tonight, if you're with us on Zoom, if you're having any issues with tech and you need a hand, um, the chat box in Zoom is your best friend. So if you're on a PC, that would be down at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you're on a mobile device, you may have to tap once on the screen and um, you may have to go into the more menu. Um, there might be three dots there and you should find the chat box in there. Um, if you're in the audience, I, I recommend keeping your video off um, just because some of our viewers are joining from uh, rural internet connections and um, sometimes things get a bit slow for them if everyone has their video on. Uh, during the Q&A, of course, everyone can turn on their video. Um, I wanted to mention, and Heather mentioned this as well, we are recording tonight. We're also live streaming to Facebook Live and YouTube. Um, so if you're uncomfortable with that, uh, you don't want to be part of the recorded broadcast, you can leave the Zoom call and just head over to the Heritage Talks Facebook page and watch live there as well. Um, and that's all I have for now. So back to you, Heather. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Our guest speaker tonight is Daniel Nolette of the Abenaki Council of Odenak. Daniel is a proud Abenaki and member of the Odenak First Nation. He has been the Director General of the Odenak Band Council for the last 16 years. Before that, he was the Director General of the Grand Conseil de la Nation Wabanaki, Inc. for 10 years. The Grand Conseil is the tribal council that provides services to the Odenak and Wolanak Band Councils. In all, he's been working for the Abenaki Nation 
for the last 29 years. He's also involved in his community with Abenaki culture. He has been learning the Abenaki language for 20 years. He is also a member of two traditional drum groups in Odinat. He is a community hunter, and along with his colleagues, Daniel hunts year-round on his Unmadikina, the traditional territory, to provide game meat to his elders and the most vulnerable people in his community. His talk this evening is called The Wabanaki of Odinak, Preserving History, Language, Culture, and Traditions. Kwai Daniel, and welcome to Heritage Talks Online. Kwai Kwai, Heather. Kwai Kwai, Mzewe. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak a little bit about uh, a part of my culture. Uh, and tonight, my main subject will be Abenaki uh, language and what we're doing to preserve and revitalize the language. So uh, I hope that uh, uh, my presentation will be interesting. So uh, um, I will start off by trying to share the screen. Can you see the presentation? Looks great, Daniel. It looks great. Just start, just make sure to start the, yeah, you got it. Okay, yeah. So, um, and at any time, if I, I have a tendency to speak a little fast, so I'll try to, to, you know, slow down as much as I can. So if I get, you know, too anxious and I get too uh, hype and speak too fast, just wave and, you know, and say, it, uh, say it right away. And then I'll try to, you know, slow my pace and, uh, and keep every, everybody's attention. So I hope uh, you find this interesting. So uh, yeah, so to start off with Abnaki language, uh, you have at the bottom of the slide there, Nisinskatabayao Mozokas, that's uh, March 24th. Nisomkwaketaba Nisinskataba Niskasegaden, that's a long word that means 2022. <laughs> Nisomkwake, that's 2000. Taba Nisinska, that's 20. And Taba Nis, that's two. Kasigaden, it means year. So let's start. So today, Pamkizgak, today, uh, my presentation is in five uh, sections, five parts, uh, divided in five parts. So the first one, first part is uh, linguistic and uh, classification. The second, uh, the state of the indigenous languages in Canada. Uh, third, uh, definition and location of the Abenakis. And four, evolution of the Abenaki language. And last, five, efforts to re revitalize the language, the Abenaki language. So we have a picture that's a picture taken on the main street in Odenak in the early 1900s. That's uh, in the far back behind the tree. That's the Anglican church uh, that is still today on the main road on Wabanaki Street. Uh, and unfortunately, the tree that you see there is no longer uh, no, no longer there. It was cut down. So the first part, linguistic classification. So where is the Abenaki language? Uh, at that point uh, in terms of class classification. <clears throat> so I will compare English versus the Abenaki, uh, a little history. Uh, so on the English uh, language is part of the Indo-European family and more closely Germanic uh, languages uh, group. And to be a more specific West subgroup. So you have the English language. So on the Abenaki side, the Abenaki language, like all First Nations language uh, in Canada, comes from the Algic family. And the Abenaki language is the, uh, from the Algonquian uh, languages group. And the, more specific, the Eastern Algonquin subgroup. So that's the Abenaki language. Cultural areas uh, in uh, North uh, and uh, Central America. So can you see my, my mouse here? Can you see? Yeah. So, sure. so the Abenaki language is part of the Northeast cultural area, which is right here. 
located on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River. So in Quebec, you have also part of the subarctic Arctic east and going as far uh, west to the west, subarctic Mackenzie, Plateau, and a little further south, the plains and the prairies. And linguistic areas in North America, uh, if you could, I will focus more on the, uh, the map legend on the far right. You have the Eskimo Aleut uh, linguistic uh, on the far north part of the territory, which is here. And you have the Beotuk, which is uh, in stick uh, uh, people and language, which was originally at uh, on the uh, Newfoundland Island right here. And you have the Algonquin, uh, Algonquin uh, linguistic language. So you could see it represents the largest part of the uh, Quebec province. And to the extent the Northeast of the uh, American uh, state in the US and through the Ontario province, the plains and the prairies right here. And in the middle, in the St. Lawrence area to the Great Lakes, you have the Iroquoian uh, linguistic uh, area and others. In Quebec, uh, we count 42 First Nation uh, communities uh, and 15 uh, Inuit villages. So, and the Abenakis are here. The two communities, Odenak and Wallenak, the two uh, orange uh, triangle. Sorry. So, indigenous nations in Quebec, according to their linguistic classification. So, you have the uh, two basic uh, basic families of language, Algonquian language. We comprise the the uh, Cree nation, the AU, the Naskapi, the Innu or the Montagnier, Atskamek, Atskamek, Nehirowisiwok, the Algonquin, Anishinaabe, the Abenaki, Alnombak, and Malisit, Wulastukkeyik, and the Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq. So on the right side that the EU, well, the Cree is usually how they go about the name, the Cree, that's how we know. But EU, like Atskamek or Nehiro Wisio, Wok, Anishinaabe, Alnambak, Wolastukkeik, and Mi'kmaq, that's the uh, original name. Uh, on the left side, that's more, uh, you would have seen see, here the Montagne, Innu. But the EU, the Naskapi Innu, uh, Nehiro Wisio, Anishinaabe, Alnambak, Wolastukkeik, and Mi'kmaq means. In our of, of our languages, it means a human being, an ordinary person, a human being. That's what it means. Abenaki, a non back, that's a human being, an être humain. And the other uh, major uh, uh, language uh, classification in, in Quebec, you have the Iroquois, which comprise the Huron Wendat in Wendage today, and the Mohawk, Canadian Ke Haka. Uh, so, and also you have the Inuit language. Uh, the Inuit uh, speak the Inuktitut. So the state of uh, the state of indigenous uh, languages in Canada. How about the Abenaki language? So what do you think? So we'll do a little, uh, a little, uh, go back to and uh, look at the statistics. So we have here. I have here the indigenous nations in Quebec according to their population. Uh, according to the census of 2015, that's our the statistic, statistics, I'm sorry, from 2015. So in the Algonquin uh, language, you have the Cree, the EU, uh, you have 18,735 uh, Cree people. The Naskapi uh, population of uh, 1,321. The Inu, uh, which is the most popular populated the uh, nation in Quebec, 19,955. The Atikamek, Nehiro Wissiwuk, 7,608. The Anishinaabe, the Algonquin, 11,748. 
the al Nawbak, the Abenakis, 2,780. That's on and off reserve. the Malisi, 1,171. And a Mi'kmaq, 6,226. On the Iroquois side, languages, you have uh, 4,001 here on one dat. Mohawk, uh, 19,026. And Inuit languages, you have uh, 12,129 Inuit. So at the total First Nations population and in Inuit in Quebec uh, in 2015 was 100,633. So you'll see where I'm going with that. The next slide. Uh, the state of the 10, the 10 languages, uh, ten, uh, the most often uh, spoken in uh, Quebec, 2016. So you have on top of the list, the Cree, uh, EU language. Uh, you could say, according to the statistic, EU, 18,735. Uh, 18, you see here the number, 16,000. So you could see that about 90% of the people, uh, the Cree speak the language. And same about the Inuktitut. Inuktitut, that's the Inuit language. You see about uh, 12,000. Uh, and that's about the, the number of Inuit people. And you see progressively the number go down, the Inu, the Montagnier, uh, a little less than 10,000. So about 70% of the people, uh, the population of the Inu speaks the language. At Skamek, roughly about 6,400. That's about... 80% of the people, 70 to 80% of the people. And that, that drops down quite dramatically with the Algonquin, the Naskapi. Well, the Naskapi, I'm sorry, but they're uh, a small nation, about 1,300 uh, members. And you could see that uh, most of them do speak the language. And about a third of the Mi'kmaq speak the language. And about 20% of the Mohawk speak the language. And you have other dialects and languages. You don't see, you don't find the al back the, the Abenaki anywhere. That's because today, it, well, back in 2016, just for the Abenaki, as you could uh, consider uh, uh, the people that spoke, that learned it from their parents uh, lang, as langue maternelle, there was uh, only four, three or four speakers, uh, Abenaki speakers. So in Canada, you see, uh, the different indigenous languages in Canada. So as you can see, the Algonquin language in Canada, which is like the turquoise color here, uh, it's pretty much the majority of the native people that speak. That's the name, uh, mostly are from the Algonquin uh, family. And you have the Inuits, the pink color, right on top of north. And, and the rest. So I won't go into uh, too much into the details, but. So again, a little bit about the statistics, indigenous uh, languages in 2006, 69% uh, of the Inuit spoke Inuktitut and the Métis, 5% uh, speak Mit, uh, Michif in 2006. And the rest, uh, of about 70 languages, about thir one third of the people would speak the language. That's in 2006. 10 years later, the number dropped. The numbers dropped. You, you look at the Inuit, 2016, now 64% of the people now do speak Inuktitut. And the Metis, 1%, 1.7% speak Michif. And the rest, 21.3% speak the language. Uh, their uh, native language. So you could see the numbers dropping. And that's why in the last couple of years, uh, the, the government of Canada has been working on uh, adopting a law, uh, trying to preserve First Nations languages in Canada. So they're still working hard on it, but uh, we haven't accomplished, accomplished much yet. But I mean, the government is still working on it and has put uh, in place and put uh, budget uh, allocation to uh, preserve the languages. So, and we're uh, 
pretty active in that department. So uh, getting uh, seeking fundings, uh, I'll get back to that a little later, but uh, we're, we're pretty active to seek funding to preserve our land, our language. So now uh, this is a picture that was taken in Odenak uh, about 1900s. And right in the middle here, you see Father Joseph de Gonzague. That was the, the priest, the missionary priest at the time. Uh, Father de Gonzague, Joseph de Gonzague was Abenaki. Uh, and he was uh, the priest in Odenak from 1895 to 1937 when he passed away. And the reason of this picture, as you see, men in, uh, here in the picture are holding uh, shovels. Uh, that is the picture taken before they started to build the convent, the school, uh, uh, where, where, which is today the museum. I'll show you a picture later. If uh, anybody, nobody has been to, you haven't been to Odenak, I will uh, show you a picture later. But that was a picture taken before they started building the convent uh, the, that became the school in Odenak. This is a census uh, of 1911. This is uh, the total population in 1911 in Walninak. Uh, this uh, Walninak is the uh, other Abenaki community, which is located on the Bekanko River, just uh, south, uh, sh uh, south shore of the St. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence River, just uh, in front of uh, Trois Rivières. So I'll try to zoom the screen. So you can see the name, uh, Henri Medzalabanlet, Antoine, Antoinette Medzalabanlet, uh, and further down, Trefle Saint-Aubin, Cécile Saint-Aubin, uh, Veuve Noël Saint-Aubin, Wilbrod Saint-Aubin, and so forth. And you have Luce Medzalabanlet, Elisabeth Thomas, and François Neptune. Uh, I will focus on those names. So those are the, 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 the people, there was about 18 people at the time living in Wallinac. That's not much. That's not. And What's interesting is in this survey, you see to the far right, one an, an interesting statistic, language sp uh, spoken at, at home. So a majority of the Abenaki and Wolinac in 1911 spoke French and English, French, English, French, French, English, and so forth, French. And here you see French, Abenaki, French, Abenaki, you don't see anybody else but them two. So in 1911, there was only two speakers left in Wallinac. So it was Elisabeth Thomas and Francois Nepton. So and in the next slideshow, this is the census in Odenac in the same year. I won't go through the names, but Clearly, you see a lot more people lived in Odenac. Uh, I would say about 200, 250 people lived in Odenac at the time. But again, going back, when I'm, if I'm, move, I'm zooming, uh, hang on. Going back to the first page. Okay. And the first name that appears on the census was Father Joseph de Gonzague, who I showed you earlier on the picture, Father de Gonzague. And you see, here that Father de Gonzague spoke Abenaki, spoke French and Abenaki. So if you look at this column, when you see language sp spoken, you see a vast majority of the people in Odenac spoke French and English, but I will reduce it a little bit, but you can see one, two, three, four, five, Abenaki, 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 same here. So in 1911, see Abenaki, 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 about 80% of the people in Odenac spoke the language. And the ones that did not speak, uh, often were uh, non-native spouses, or else, like you see here, the, the names after Father de Gonzague were, uh, were the teacher with the nuns. Sar, uh, 
ça, euh, Marie-Fleur, euh, Am Amanda Lafleur, etc., etc. So, so in 1911, about 80% of the people were fluent speakers in Abenaki. And yet, it took about three generations to say that no longer anybody, nobody now speaks Abenaki as its langue maternelle. So that's, I thought it was an inter interesting uh, thing to show you. Uh, so again, now this is the, the, the picture when I showed you the, the men with the shovel with the father, the Gonzac, that's the, uh, the convent that was used to be the school. It was built in early, uh, early 1900. And the Abenaki of Odenak went to school uh, there in that uh, school until 1959. The school was closed in 1959. And at the time, the, the Green Nuns uh, of uh, Ottawa came and taught the children in Odenak. And the people were, uh, I mean, the kids the, the, were not allowed to speak the language at school. So that one is one of the explanation of uh, how uh, the Abenaki language declined because they were told that it was a sin, you could not speak the language, and even the kids were beaten when they were uh, caught uh, talking uh, Abenaki at school. So, so today, this uh, building uh, now is, uh, you can find a museum. Uh, the museum today is the keeper of the culture, but also the language and all of the archives and artifacts uh, that uh, still uh, I guess, is, is, is the story keeper of the Abenaki history and culture. So now uh, at, the, at the third part of section, the definition and location of the Abenakis. This, oh, this on the far right, the, the image here, you can see that's uh, the tr traditional regalia of the Abenaki man and women uh, that pay, that represent the regalia uh, at the 18th century, so 1700s. As you can see and notice, uh, you don't find the big headdress uh, like you see in the movies, like you see in the Western movies, uh, Indians wearing the big headdress, you know, like uh, uh, this is more typical. This is typical of the Abenaki hat and, you know, and uh, quaif, uh, you had yeah, we were wearing feathers, but only a few at the tip of the hat. So you have the men and the women. The origin of the, uh, the, origin of the Abenakis. So the Abenakis come from Wambanaki. Wambanaki. So we'll do a little bit of etymology. Wamban, it means dawn, the dawn. It whitens. And Aki, land. Wamban, Aki. So we're the people of the dawn. Al-Namba, like I said earlier, it means human being. Al-Namba. The eight, oh, I forgot, maybe. I'm, uh, first of all, in, in all native language, and especially Abenaki, we do pronounce all of the letters. And often you will, you will see, why, why is there an eight in, in, in your vocabulary? But the eight is actually a nasal sound. Oh, oh, oh. Wambanaki. Al-Namba. Al-Namba on Wangan, the Abenaki language. Literally, it means a human being's way of expressing himself. Al-Namba, human being. On doit speak. Wangan, that's the action. So, the human being's way of expressing himself. Al-Namba on doit Wangan. So, the Abenaki, the Wambanaki, uh, the traditional territory was the west boundary is the uh, Richelieu River. This is Lake Champlain. So Richelieu River all the way to the east, to the coast. The Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, Norridge Walk, Pigwaket, Penacook, Nipmuc, Wampanoag, we're all in Sokoki and Kowasuk. And here they are Al Sigontaguk. That's us today. Al Sigontaguk. Al Sigontaguk. Uh, Al Sigontuk, it's the San Francisco River. That's how we 
uh, we call the San Francisco River in our language, Al Sigon Tuk. That's the, the river of the empty cabins. That's what it means. So Al Sigon Tuk, that's the Abenaki of Odenak today. And Walnak is here, uh, right here, located here. So this is the territory of the Wabanaki people. This is a map. Uh, you see this the Lake St. Pierre right here. Or the neck here, St. Francis River is here. So this is to show you, uh, because of the settlement, you could see there's a lot of population as the, the settlers uh, you know, populated the south shore of the St. Lawrence River are in Dakina, our traditional territory. Just as, as reference, uh, the Abenakis had to uh, seek uh, their source of food uh, up north on the Saint, uh, of the St. Lawrence River. So we, we went from the 19th century, early 19th century, uh, had to hunt uh, in the Algonquin territory. Uh, at the time, there was an Algonquin tribe in Tuovia, so we had an agreement with them uh, so we could hunt and uh, for our way of living at the time. So just as for reference. Now, this is uh, a, pic, uh, a, a slide that represents uh, all of the little uh, red diamonds, yellow circles, green tri triangles, the blue square and white circle. Those are toponyms. And if you, I don't know if I can blow it a little bit more. Uh, actually, the white circle are actual official toponyms and if you look at uh, the ones in yellow per se and the red uh, diamond those are the, the the orange or red diamonds are possible abenaki toponyms but for sure the ones in the yellow a circle are for sure Abenaki toponyms. So Amis approved the, the, the presence of the Abenaki uh, for a long period of time. Just for an example, whoops. Uh, one of the toponyms uh, you, you know uh, of uh, Quatikuk, Quatikuk in uh, the townships. Quatikuk in our language is Kwatagook, Kwatagook. It means at the river, at the pine river. Koa is a pine, the white pine, the big tree. Uh, so probably at, on the, at the Quaticook River, there was a big white pine. So uh, that's a significance. So Koa to Gook, that's a, uh, uh, today called Quaticook, uh, derived from Koa to Gook. Um, again, also in the townships, you have Manfrey Magog, Manfrey Magog, in our language, it's mamlao bagak. Mamlao bagak. It means a big and deep uh, pool of river, uh, pool pool of water. Mamlao bagak. So the Lake Lake Mefremega for sure is big, and it's really really deep uh, at some point. So those are actually uh, Abenaki, Wabanaki toponyms. Again, uh, that's the St. Francis River. You find Al Nombai Sego Neganal, that's Abenaki Reserve. You have one in Odenak. Uh, Odenak today, we have a population on reserve of 400, 456 people, but a total membership about 2,900 uh, 2, band members. So 456 reside on the reserve, but 2,400 reside, re, uh, reside off reserve either in, uh, in uh, the surroundings, Pierreville, Notre Dame, and Trois-Rivières, and, and other places in Montreal. But a good portion of our people live today in, uh, in the Ontario uh, and in the New England, New England state. Uh, we have a, a great uh, number of people that lives in, also in uh, New York state, Albany, Troy, Schenectady area. Uh, and the other community for uh, Abenaki community, Waldenak on the Bikanku River, I told you before, just uh, across the river from Tuolvia. So the evolution of the Abenaki language. The first, the first you, as you can uh, imagine, uh, there was no writings. 
uh, before the Jesuit priest came into contact with the native people. Uh, every, uh, the, the transmission of the language was oral to oral tradition. We learned it at home. And the first one to write the language, the Abenaki language, was Father Raoul, who was a Jesuit, Jesuit priest. And he was in, uh, it was not called Odanak at the time, but at the mission in 1691. Awan sis, sis, it means a child. Awan sis. That's how he wrote it. A8 and the on. I'll, I'll explain, I will get to that. But the on sound, he used to write it A N and Umalot on the end. Awan sis. And then uh, Father Aubery uh, wrote uh, also a manuscript, a dictionary in 1715. Uh, and that's how he wrote it. I want this pretty much like Father Raal uh, wrote it. And then fa uh, further, you had another Jesuit priest, Father de la Brosse in 1760. He wrote I want this a different way. He used the, a, the U instead of the A. And the U left. Uh, the picture. And then later, Pial, Pial Paul Ozonkeline, he was Abenaki. He, uh, he uh, went to school at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, and he got a degree in education and later came back to teach uh, at Odenac uh, for the Anglican uh, band members at the time. So we, in 1830, Pial, Pial Paul Ozonkeline wrote also a dictionary and that's how he wrote I want sis so a w o with underscore s s i s I want sis like I do like I said earlier you do have to pronounce all of the letters so the s at the end it's not a uh, silent uh, letter it's it is I want sis and later uh, in 1884 Joseph Laurent Joseph Lola uh, who was uh, for a long time chief here in Odenac, wrote uh, Awansis, O with uh, an accent on top, accent circonflex. So he wrote, he wrote his dictionary in 1884. And he taught also on the Catholic side, the Catholic uh, children. So uh, like and he, he taught because he taught before the arrival of the, uh, the nuns, the great nuns who arrived uh, later in uh, 1900. I want sis. You have Henry Lone Master, who was uh, Pial Polo uh, uh nephew. Uh, Henry Lone Master wrote also a dictionary in 1932, and that's how he wrote I want sis. Now you, you find, you start to find the eight, the nasal sound, I want sis. And Gordon Day. Gordon Day was an ethnobotanist who got interested. In uh, in learning the names of the plants in Abenaki. So he came to Odenac uh, in the 1950s and 60s, and he interviewed uh, a lot of the people in Odenac at the time. And that's how he got interested in the language. So he took, he recorded a lot of the, the old people at the time, the elders and the people in Odenac. So we still have today a lot of those recordings. And he, he had notes he wrote notes and to how to pronounce and what the uh, words uh, meant. So um, that's how he wrote it. I want sis. I want sis. Let's say I want sis. And later, uh, Monique Nonette Illy, uh, she learned uh, uh, Abenaki from my aunt, my great aunt, uh, Cecile Wawanole. And she also at her uh, time wrote in 1996, uh, she uh, wrote a little dictionary. I want sis. So Today, that's how we write I want sis, a child. Just to, to, to show you a little bit of uh, the evolu evolution of the language, I will show you another word, armus, armus. Father Raal in 1691 wrote armus. Armus is a dog. Armus, armuski. Everybody knows Rimouski. Rimouski is a town in the uh, 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 in Bas Saint Laurent. Rimouski. The original name of uh, Rimouski was Armouski. It means land of the dog. 
but not the dog, the puppy, the dog, the, the, uh, the seal. If you ever been, ever been to uh, Le Parc du Bic in Rimouski, at low tide, you see the seals uh, laying on the rocks, you know, uh, at low tide. And at times you could hear those seals, they bark like a dog. So that's why it was called Armuski, Almoski, which became Rimouski after a while. Al Armos. Father Uberi wrote it the same. Oh, this is a major difference. Atia, Adia, Adia. Father Labrosse, de la Brosse wrote Adia. Adia is another way to say a dog. Uh, that's a, a root. In our language, Nadia Lo Wangan, Nadia Lo Wangan, Adea, Nadia Lo Wangan, it means hunting. In the days, it means that Abenakis hunt with the dog. Nadia Lo Wangan, Adea. And Pialpolo Zonkaline wrote later in 1830, Almus. So the evolution of the language, back in the old days, we had a gurgle sound, Armus. But in the mid, the middle of the 19th century, the middle of the 1800s, the language, Abenaki language, softened. We lost the R and we traded to for the L. It became more like soft. Almus, almus. So Joseph Larin the same. Almus, almus with master. And today we use this way of, uh, to, to write it, almus. So again, quickly, 1691, Father Raoul wrote a manuscript. This is a, a picture uh, taken of his original manuscript. So uh, good luck if you, could, if you can read what, what is written in there. So this uh, manuscript is kept at Harvard University, but we are we're fortunate to have a transcription of that manuscript and we use it today as a reference. And Father Aubry uh, in the 18th century wrote uh, his manuscript. So this is part of uh, Father Aubry's manuscript. And perhaps some of you have seen a uh, documentary about the restoration, restoration of this manuscript. Uh, it was, uh, uh, you could see it was aired uh, on CBC and two ladies uh, got a grant, got a, uh, a grant from the government to restore this manuscript. This manuscript is, is kept today at the museum in Odenak and it's quite precious. So basically what they did, they detached all of the pages, they cleaned all of the paper when once it will be made public again, you will see the pages are went uh, went back to from being like yellowish like color and the stain. So they removed the stain and they removed the yellow color. So so you could see today you will see it's back to be white black on white. So that's uh, really interesting and uh, and and fine to see. So this is Father Uberi's. Uh, picture of his old manuscript. So, and later, 19th century, Pierre Polo Zonkaline wrote his uh, Kim Zoe Awikigan. So this is uh, his book. Uh, again, uh, Pierre Polo Zonkaline learned uh, and, and became a teacher and he learned at uh, Dartmouth University. So this is more like a, a uh, study book uh, than a dictionary. Kim Zoe Awikigan, Awikigan, it's a book. Awikigan. Uh, Kim Zoe means uh, Agakimze and Dagakimze say, I learn, I'm learning. So a book to learn. So the different sound, ba, be, be, et cetera, et cetera. This is Joseph Florin, uh, Joseph Florin's dictionary that was, uh, uh, he wrote it in 1894 and then it was typed. So you could see some of the words, uh, God, the great spirit, Tsenewask, and the deity, Newaskowangan. See if you remember a few slides earlier, you see the O with the accent, Newaskowangan. 
Interesting. And in the 20th century, Henry Lorne Master wrote Abenaki Le Indian Legends in 1932. So this is uh, it's uh, this is his book. So and the found the, fun, the funny well not the funny but interesting thing about his book, as you can see, he writes in this uh, a legend or a story, Maguac Tawambanakak. Maguac are our, our, our way to uh, call the Mohawk people Maguac and Wambanakak, the Mohawks and the Abenaki, the Iroquois and the Abenaki. You see, he wrote it in Abenaki, and then you have the English translation right under. So this is his, and also he had written a manuscript, that's a master's manuscript and uh, in French and Abenaki. So earlier I mentioned about Gordon Day. Gordon Day was uh, his research uh, uh, first on the, the, the plants, the names of the plants, and later that became an interest in learning about the Abenaki language. Uh, his uh, research uh, and, uh, and work was being, uh, he was uh, being paid by the Musée Canadien des Civilisations in Hull, and uh, so to conduct his research. So, unfortunately, he was not able to see the final, uh, final piece of work. Uh, from his research and all of the years that he came to Odanak and interviewed the people. But all of the notes, the transcription, transcriptions of his notes, uh, working notes, uh, Jeannie Brink, a, an Abenaki, uh, Simon Sissa Bamsa Witness's granddaughter, she collected all of uh, Gordon Day's notes and she made a book, Western Abenaki Dictionary. Actually, the credit goes to Gordon Day, but she actually put it in, to, in, in the typing, Gordon Day's note. So this is the Eng Abenaki English version. And there's also a pink one, uh, which is the, uh, I, could, I could show you, I have it here. So this is the English and Abenaki version. So you have the pink, and the blue books from uh, Gordon Day's note. So finally, the efforts to revitalize the Abenaki language. Like I said, when, when Gordon Day came to do his uh, research in Odenak in 1950s and 60s, still pretty much uh, 50 to 60% of the people at the time still spoke the language. And in a matter of uh, one or two generations after, Nobody speaks the language anymore. So, so we're trying to gather, uh, if we, if we uh, summarize, you know, like Father Ralph, Father Aubry, Pierre Paul Ozonkaline, uh, you have uh, Joseph Florent, Henry Lone Master, you have different references, Gordon Day. So we're trying to, today our efforts is, are to standardize the language. As you remember, I've showed you a few slides before. There are different ways, different people wrote the language differently. So we're trying to standardize today. Well, let's convene, let's write the word, this word, this way. So in order to facilitate the, uh, the learning of the language. So we started starting in 1996 when Monique Nolette Hill uh, wrote her little dictionary. See, you see, Abbe. A B, Wawelamwa. Ashte to purchase. I purchase and Manoha. Animate and Mano home and animate. So she worked on a little dictionary because she, after my aunt Cecil, she was old. When my aunt Cecil, she was born in 1908 uh, here in Odenak. She, uh, well, she learned the language from her mother and father at home. She later married an American. Uh, man, and they, she moved to the United States. But when my uncle retired, my great uncle retired, she moved back to Odenak. She was in her early 80s. She, she, she felt bad about the fact that the language, you know, we were losing the language. So she made the efforts and she was the first modern teacher, uh, let's put it this way, modern teacher to try to re uh, revitalize the language in Odenak. So she taught Abenaki. I learned a little bit. I started to learn with her. And one of her best students was Monique Nadette Hill. 
she uh, at the time was in her 60s, uh, Monique. Uh, unfortunately, her mother and father, she lost her mother when she, her father, sorry, her father when she was, uh, she was young. And her mother, uh, even though she, she was Abenaki, Madeleine Nolette did not speak the language. So she learned Monique uh, with my aunt, my aunt um, uh, Cecile. So when my aunt Cecile retired in the early 1990s, uh, Monique Nolette Ile took over the teaching of the language. So she started off by writing her own little dictionary. And then uh, later uh, in the early 2000 or about year 2000, she uh, went on with uh, grants that we did receive from uh, Heritage Canada. Uh, we got from uh, Initiative uh, in Language uh, and Language and Culture. So we got a grant and she was able to uh, wrote, write a grammar. So to uh, start to learn language, try to uh, just, I won't, I won't go into details, but it's quite complicated uh, for, for, I will speak for Abenaki. Uh, Abenaki and, and like all uh, First Nations language, it starts off is as the subject. What you are talking about is the subject animate or inanimate. If it's inanimate, then there are one way to uh, conjugate it. If it's inanimate, there's a, another way. For instance, arbre, a tree, it's abasé, that's animate. As basic, all animates, all living things are animate. And, but uh, on the opposite, uh, it's not all not living things that are inanimate. Uh, just for instance, in fruits and berries, some fruits and berries are animate, others are not. In squick women's, that's a strawberry, that's animate. But sata, a blueberry, is inanimate. Sata. So the difference in animate and inanimate, in this instance, abazi is animate, abazi, a tree. The plural, that's singular, one tree. Abazi ak, trees. Same as an eagle, mgezo, mgezo ak, plural, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, so she wrote, uh, she, wrote she uh, drafted a grammar to facilitate the teaching of the language. So this is just uh, to give you an example. And then later, a few years after, uh, in order also to facilitate the, the, the transmission of the language, she worked on a uh, um, the, the, those are DVDs uh, uh, to teach the language. Parlons Abenaki, let's speak Abenaki. So you have there volume one and volume four. So we have four DVDs uh, starting from the scratch, the beginning, the basic of uh, learning the language. And the last one, volume four, is uh, small talks, you know, like a, uh, a conversation, a small conversation between two persons. So you start from the beginning to understand the alphabet, the pronunciation, animate, inanimate, nouns, uh, pronouns, verbs, et cetera, et cetera. So those are tools that we, the, the Bank Council has developed with the help of Monique Nalet Ile to help the, the transmission of, and the teaching of the language. And today, uh, a few years ago, uh, Monique Nolette, uh, I guess as she was getting older, she lost the interest and also the energy to teach the language. So later, uh, about, I would say close now to 10 years ago, Philippe Charlin, who was the best student uh, at the Monique Nolette's class. Philippe Charlin is uh, not, uh, he's not Abenaki, he's a, uh, a Quebecer, lives, uh, lived in Saint-Julie uh, near Montreal. He got interested in the language. Uh, he was doing his thesis uh, at the university on, on in geography and uh, for the, uh, about the toponyms. So he got interested in the Abenaki toponyms. So then later uh, got really, really interested in to learning the language. So much that he's so good that now today, Philippe Charlin teaches the Abenaki language. And he's not Abenaki but I'm a proud student of Philip. I'm doing good, but 
I'm not comfortable enough to teach it yet. But uh, and so Philip uh, took uh, Gordon Day's dictionary and tried to uh, standardize the language because one one reality with Gordon Day, just for instance, no Abenaki word starts with the letter B. So you see here, abandon, baba ghetto. Reality is paba ghetto. So we had to redo uh, because actually, per perhaps he didn't write. He, he wrote the language as he heard, he heard it. So use the B instead of a P. You use the G instead of a K. So, so we basically had to redo all of his work. So. Like you see here, O Ogeza Wataket Wakata Ogeza Ogeza Wakaton is you should see a W at the beginning, not an O. Like Geze Bazeto, it's Keze, it's a K, not a G. So basically, Philip did read it all of a, went through all of a, a Gordon Day's note and he uh, rewrote the Abenaki uh, dictionary of Gordon Day, uh, according to our standardized, uh, the standard, standard way to that, that we write the language today. So this is uh, what was done. And today the dictionary is, comprises uh, uh, 10,000 words. And because of, uh, well, because of the COVID, uh, Prior to the COVID, uh, the Abenaki, uh, the people who wanted to learn Abenaki had to be in attendance. And we were, uh, we had classes every Tuesday night uh, from seven to nine at the Anon Bawe Center here in Odenak. And in Wallenak also, they had a place where they, they were teaching the language. But because of the COVID, we had to uh, uh, think, uh, think over how could we, you know, transmit and teach the language without, you know, uh, and, and, you know, not contravene the uh, public health, public health is, uh, regulations. So because of the COVID and because of the modern technology, we thought of uh, teaching with uh, Zoom, uh, use, using Zoom. Well, I, as, as tonight, what we're doing, we're having uh, this, 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 uh, this meeting uh, in a Zoom session. So this is Philippe Charlin here teaching the language. And here, I'm here, right here. This is me uh, learning. So uh, for the last couple of years, we had our uh, uh, Abenaki, Abenaki classes in, in Zoom meetings. And it allows people from the outside. So here you have, uh, that's Helen uh, Obamsa when she lives in uh, St. Hilaire. Olivier lives in Saint Etienne de Bolton. Uh, Pascal Obamsawan lives in Montreal. I live here in Odenac. Uh, Sylvain here lives in Saint Mathieu du Parc. So what I'm getting at is people from all over. Uh, and even today we have 15 people on a regular basis that uh, attend our Abenaki classes. And we have four or five of them band members that are uh, living in the Ottawa area. So in a matter of a click, plop, they're joining the, the, the Abenaki class. So this is one way to try to keep the language alive. Other efforts that the council uh, also uh, puts its efforts to show the language. When you come to Odenak, you will notice the stop signs are in three languages. Tsana, it's not shana. We don't have the sh sound in Abenaki. It's tsana, like T-S. Tsana, are, stop. One other way, this, this is, uh, I would say, a premiere. Uh, not a lot of people have seen those yet. Those will be the new street signs. Uh, they, we got them in December, beginning of December. So sure enough, winter came quick and the ground froze too quick. So we were not able to install them. But first thing, when temperature and then the weather allows us to do so, we'll install the new street sign. Right now, all of the street signs in Odenak are in Abenaki, but Abenaki only. 
So what we thought is to revamp the street sign is to have the main Abenaki, one Banaki on the on these street, uh, one Banaki. You also have a pictogram. It means the rising sun, the land of the rising sun, land of the dawn. One Banaki on the. You'll see ta, rue Terre de l'eau and land of the dawn street. And so you have it in your three languages. So just to, just just uh, one example of one of them. And when you come to Odenac, you'll see also you'll notice on the building, uh, we're we're proud of our language. So you'll see pretty much on all of the buildings, the uh, the the let's say here it's government is Abenaki Odenac, Abenaki government over Odenac, Atale Atale Tabal Danzemek. So you have always the three languages. So Abenaki also. So this is the band office. I'm right here in the back on the second floor. Uh, this is the library uh, that's uh, located uh, right next to the band office. That's our old band office. Uh, you see it's, whoops. Awikigani Gamikuk, that's the Maison du Livre, that's the book house, that's the library. And so, uh, we, like I said, uh, we have we made great efforts to show uh, uh, our differences, show our language. And this is brand new. That was built uh, last summer and inaugurated in September. Kizus, in our language, Kizus is a sun. It also, also means uh, a month, but mainly it's a sun, Kizus. And La Camiguizo Saik Sak. That's uh, the Sal Familial. That's a family, family, family room. So this is uh, a place where the kids, uh, the youth, uh, when when they um, have a, a they off of school, when they have a journée uh, pedagogique, they go to the family house and to get the teaching about our culture, about our language, and also uh, people in uh, the kids that have uh, difficulties at school, then they have stimulation uh, workshops also in that, in that place. So this is the health center. Uh, that's uh, a zoom in of a picture of the sign. Uh, that's the health center, the Maison de la Santé. That's what it means. The, uh, And also every sign in our office, uh, we also have uh, the title of uh, each uh, office uh, in Abenaki also, French, uh, French, English, and also Abenaki. Also one way to promote the language also, we have three times a year, Wabanaki Pilask, that's our newsletter that's being published three times a year. And in each, uh, newsletter, we have a little short column of the Abenaki language. So, oh boy, it's only eight o'clock. I'm sorry. Uh, this is uh, pretty much what I wanted to share with you tonight. I uh, hope that uh, you found it interesting. I uh, hope I didn't bore too many people. Uh, no way, Daniel. That was a marvelous presentation. I'm, I'm just so impressed about you know, the amount of work that you and other people, you're from Tante Cecile to uh, you know, all the others that went before, that to record the language and to learn it and to relearn it and to create new dictionaries and text. It's such a lot of work. And you realize how important language is to protection of culture they go hand in hand really and uh, without the language you don't have well your culture is threatened and I didn't realize how threatened the language was if there's only just a handful of speakers you know so such marvelous work and I thank you so much and I uh, I'll just before I, I let the, the audience come on I'll, I'll ask Glenn just to just to remind everybody how to ask questions and I know questions have been pouring in and we'll get to the chat box really soon so I'll just take a uh, second for Glenn to remind everybody how to do it.
Great job, Daniel. Um, indeed, that's the start of the question and answer. Um, so the chat box is probably your easiest option if you're here on Zoom. Um, you can either write uh, that you have a question and we'll put you in the queue and I'll unmute your mic for you and I'll, I'll bring you on. You can turn on your camera if you want, although you don't have to. Um, if you're a bit camera shy, you're also welcome just to leave your question in the chat box and Heather or myself will relay it to Daniel on your behalf. Otherwise, if you're joining us on Facebook Live or YouTube, um, leave your question down in the comment section and I will do my best to get over there and take a look and I will relay those questions to Daniel as well. Just if you're on Zoom and you know where the, uh, the raise hand button is, you can also use that. Not everyone knows where it is, but for the, for the pro users out there, feel free to use the raise hand button that works well. Um, okay, back to you, uh, Heather. Okay, great. Well, I'll start with the chat box then because there's quite a few for you here, Daniel. Mm -hmm. we're, uh, this is from Judy. Were the Abenaki ever settled in the Memphremagog region or was that territory they traveled on? Uh, there are, uh, there are, uh, they, were, they, they found some artifacts. You know where, you, uh, where the marina is, where the Mary house is mm -hmm. on the main yeah. street and Ma in Magog, right on the shore of the Magog river, just on the mouth of the uh, Memphremagog lake, they found, there are traces of, 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 uh, of not a settlement, but uh, the Abenaki used uh, Lake Mayfermagog for traveling more. But for sure, at times they had to uh, stop for rest, you know, uh, uh, to hunt, to fish, to for so their sustenance. But there's not, there's no known long-term, long-time settlement there in the Lake Mayfermagog area. But traces of passage, and they stop and stay there for a little while. Okay, um, Judy. Al oh, sorry, <laughs> no, Judy I was, also. I was uh, asked it, it, in the Gordon Day information. There was a reference to Abenaki Springs. Where would that be? The Abenaki Springs is uh, um, in Saint Francis, where the village of Saint Francois du Lac is. Uh, if you're familiar uh, with the area, um, Saint Francis Agomek on the other side of the river. It's uh, Right at the corner of, if you go on Google Map or Google uh, Google Earth, it's at the corner of Radiptai uh, and uh, Rambois de Masca. So they found a source of mineral water there, and to a point that they built a hotel in the mid of eight, the 1800s, and I think the hotel stayed open till 1930. I have stories of my grandparents. My grandfather, uh, my, my mother's father, uh, used to go with his uh, girlfriend, my grand that later became a grandmother. Uh, they went to the hotel. Uh, they canoed, and just 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 as a reference, uh, Abenaki Spring from here, uh, it's uh, roughly six kilometers. So if you can imagine, in those days, six kilometers. Uh, uh, canoeing down the river uh, to go to the hotel for, because at the time there was uh, no bridge. Uh, the, there was only like ferries to go across the river at the time. So my grandfather used to take my, gra my, my, my grandmother on a canoe to go and go dancing and have a little fun there at the Habanaki Spring Hotel. Yeah. That's so, fantastic. Uh, but, but, but today you can still have the little tin shed where the tap is and still they do uh, Every now and then, uh, I think now it belongs to the Pepsi company, Pepsi. So they do still bottle the uh, Abenaki uh, spring water. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you, uh, if there were any, I know you had dictionaries, but were there any texts left uh, by people in the past that were like poems or songs or idioms or that add color to the language, not just rows of, of words? Unfortunately, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy that you, you talk about poems. For native languages, people didn't talk uh, poetry. They mm. spoke, literally, it means what it means. Uh, there was, because often, I, I'm laughing, because often we're, I've, I've been asked to do some translation. And often our artists, you know, songwriters, and, and they, they write in poetry. And 
there's no way sometimes to to reflect what you know the the lyric it wants him to mean for instance uh it's it, it the wind blows mm. uh there's no cool breeze small breeze it the wind blows or it doesn't blow or it blows hard or it blows a swirl uh They, uh, what I'm getting at is, is they, 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 they didn't, they talk for, you know, straight to the point. Uh, right. They had work to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Time Because for the poetry. If, if, you know, you, you make up words with roots, different roots, and it means what it means. So often it, it's hard. And, and, and also there are no, uh, there are no uh, meanings. There are no words in our language. Uh, according uh, you know with the modern uh, technology for uh, a, com a computer we don't have any words for a computer uh, even environment there was no such uh, concept of environment so we had to come up with a word I walk uh, walk on gun it's all living things uh, that's how uh, we are one gun I'm sorry we are we are one gun it's all living things uh, so that's how we came to uh come up with the word so so often we have to come up and invent some some of the words right that's fascinating yeah um and and you what you, you mentioned that it's it's part of the algonquin language group mm -hmm. is, is there any way you you understand what someone in the, the cree terror cree people are saying or is there any words that are the same The closest, uh, closest language to Abenaki is Penobscot, and that's why I laughed at Louis Dana. She's Penobscot, and she's she's in attendance. And Louis Penobscot is the closest language, and we could understand pretty much word for word what what they say. Uh, Cree Cree is more close to Atskamek and Inu. Uh, <laughs> And thank you, Louis. Uh, so yes, so you have different. You have some same words like in Inu, uh, a river is Shipu. Uh, in Atskamek is Sipi. In Abenaki is Sibu. So you could, and like a beaver, beaver, uh, Tmakwa Amisk, uh, or Amisk, uh, and Anishinaabe Amisk. Uh, and so, so some of the bear, so some of the words. I mean, you could, you could. But what we think is back in the old days, there was a common language, a common way to for the people that when they met, they understood each other. But at times the, the dialects and the languages differed and, and, and got different. But I would like just just today, uh, there's even like I said earlier, Mi'kmaq is uh, part of the Wambanaki is part, probably the, one of the more distant language to the Abenaki. So somebody would uh, speak to me in Mi'kmaq, I wouldn't understand a word. Okay. But Mali Seed, a little bit, Penobscot, even more. Penobscot okay, and that's... Abenaki is really, really almost the same. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I, I a, see we I have, have a raised hand. Oh, sorry, I had to saw a raised hand from I, Matthew. I'm going to butt in in front of our okay. executive director. <laughs> sorry, Matthew. I'm, I'm really, in, you know, I, I'm very passionate about learning languages and I know how hard it can be as a non-native speaker Um, especially if you're not around that language every day and it's not you're not immersed in it. I'm wondering if you could reflect a bit, Daniel, given what Heather was asking on your own learning experience and and what's really worked for you, what resources did you find the most helpful in, in learning your ancestral language? Uh, actually, uh, I try to always, always refer to when I heard the language at my grandparents' house, my aunt's house, uh, I try to connect with my my memory on the pronunciation and also uh i really rely all, all, all mostly on gordon days uh and monique nolette and joseph Larin. actually i i have i didn't bring my my school bag but i have every every of the uh manuscript and or transcription of the manuscript every tools that i showed in my presentation i have a copy So I use pretty much ev every one of them. Uh, and that's what makes it interesting. So when I'm trying to find a word, I'm going through Gordon Day. If I can't find it, I go to Aubery, I go to Laurent. I have to, sometimes I have to go through more than one 
uh, reference to re really make sure that we have the right word and uh, the right, uh, and, and because often, I mean, we have, like I said, come up with a word, invent a word. So I rely on those sources to say, okay, uh, how would Gordon Day, uh, how would people tell told Gordon Day and how would Joseph Larin would have uh, said, well, this word, I would say this uh, for this word. So, uh, but I, yeah, I used all of them tools. <laughs> I have, I don't know if you could see, but th those are all Abenaki references. So this, this all shelf there, this is Father Aubery's uh, manuscript. The one I showed you earlier, the yellow pages, this is a photocopy of Father Aubery's manuscript. So I have, I have it here, so. I see you got some, it looks like you have some cassette tapes there too, am I correct? Yeah, those are Gordon Day's, uh, oh. Yeah, so those are part of Gordon Day's recording that he did here in the 1950s and 60s. So I have a, a copy of the recordings of, uh, and, and today we're trying to digitize those because we, we're afraid to lose, uh, they get demagnetized, you know, uh, the old cassette tapes. So we're, we're trying to digitize them today with the, with the help of uh, University of Sherbrooke, uh, with Daniel Desroches, works at the University of Sherbrooke, and to get all that, and so we, we don't lose it. Wonderful, lose the pronunciation. It's, it's, it's it literally, it's, you, you can hear them singing. It's not, they're not talking, they're singing actually. Wonderful. I want to bring on my executive director, Matthew Farfan. Matthew, so, someone, on... someone I uh, saw, saw a raise. Uh, yeah, that was my executive director. <laughs> oh, okay. It may have been someone else too. Matthew, I'm going to unmute you. Um, hey, Matthew, welcome. Hi, Daniel. Hi. What a, what a natural speaker you are. What a great presentation. Thank you. I was wondering, <clears throat> would you describe the Abenaki of all the of all the indigenous languages in, in Canada? Is that one of the harder languages to learn basically from scratch? And how do you how do you see the future? What is the prognosis for the future of the language, at least in the in the community here? Good question. Uh, as for the first question, I don't think it's the hardest. I think every First Nations language has its own challenge. They all, like I said, they all pretty much form the same way, the same animate, inanimate, same concept, animate, inanimate. So, and, uh, so, but they all have their own specifics. And the, the hardest part of the learning today uh, is like I said, is it animate or inanimate? And all living things are inanimate. That's that's a given. That's easy. But not all not living things are inanimate. So that's what makes it hard in the learning. So you always have to question yourself: Is it animate or inanimate? So you cannot, when you think, you cannot like fluently speak because you always have to think ahead of time. Say, oh, is this inanimate? Just for instance, I'll, I'll give you an example. Asazit, a glass. Asazit, that's animate. Anamiha, asazit. I see a glass. A book, awikigan. Anamito, awikigan. I see a book. Anamiha, asazit, anamito, awikigan. Again, to make it a little more, this this is un, indefinite, right? I see a book, I see a glass. Anamiton andawikigan. Anamiton andawikigan. I see my book. So that's a, that's a difference. Anamihon and and that's as it them. This is my, I see my glass. So definite, indefinite, animate, inanimate. So, so imagine that, that, that's hard. That's a challenge. Now, as for the, 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 the other question was again, sorry. 
Uh, the future. Oh, the future. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, actually, if if you would have, you would have asked me this question two years ago, I was just, mm, pretty much pessimistic. But today, with because of Zoom, the pandemic gave us good tools, and 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 I guess forced us to be a little more in more inventive. So because of the tool that such as a Zoom or Teams or uh, a video conference we're able to connect with with others when we had classes in attendance we started the semester 10 12 people eager to learn after a couple of weeks 10 after three weeks four after five six weeks two three of us were in the classroom but because of zoom we have on a steady base 12 to 15 people learning the language and because of those tools because of we are now able to teach at Montreal Native, and Odenac, University of Sherbrooke, Lenoxville soon will be uh, having also an Abenaki class uh, session at uh, Bishop and Kiuna College in Odenac. That's a, a, a college, a college, a college uh, level. They also have uh, native language uh, teaching. So they, has, they have Abenaki classes. So what I'm getting at is I think we're that close and next summer, next summer, we want to have one weekend of immersion camp in Abenaki. So we think we have enough people to speak and sustain a small talk for uh, at least one or two days. So we'll force ourselves to have an immersion Abenaki. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not hoping to... Uh, and hoping for people to speak fluently Abenaki in the near future, but to have at least enough people to have a basic of the language so we can sustain small talks. Critical mass. Yeah. Don't give up. You're, you're no, doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I have one last question for you, Daniel, and it's from Jane. The Abenaki traveled a lot and even settled in the United States. Mm -hmm. Is there interest in the language there too? Mm -hmm. Yes, my aunt Cecil and later her son taught uh, Abenaki in the States also. So yes, there, there is. And we have, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to focus on French Abenaki. But if we have enough, enough people, uh, English, spe English speaking uh, band members that wants to learn it, we'll set up uh, a a English and Abenaki class also. Yeah, but, but there is, there is. There is a, 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 a band members that want to learn it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think Glenn has a few questions from the Facebook crowd. Really great uh, Facebook attendance tonight and lots of engagement there. I'm going to hop over and try to try to go through these. I'm sorry if I, I miss anyone's question there. Um, lots of encouragement to Danielle. So check that out after. Oh yeah. Um, Karina was wondering, she just wanted you to repeat the name of uh, Lac Memphremagog and Abenaki. Mamlo uh, Bagak. Hang on. Uh, I'll, I'll try to find a piece of paper. Mamlo Bagak. Mam. Slow. Bagak. Ooh, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Mamlao Bagak. It means a large uh, and deep body of water. I realized I started talking, bago, I started talking bago, over bago. you. Huh? <laughs> can you hold that up again, Daniel? I'm going to keep my mouth shut. and can oh. see it. Mamlao Bagak. Mamlao Bagak. Mam, it's big. La. La is deep. Bagak, that refers to a body of water. A lake, a pond. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. I'm going to, I'm going to see a, a couple of others in here. Um, Rachel Lambie was asking, is the list of location toponyms available anywhere? Ooh, good question. Uh, we have, we have a list of some of them. Uh, if the person wants to uh, contact me through my email address, I could provide her with a list of uh, some of the toponyms. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. But officially, we're working with the uh, Commission des Toponymies du Québec to have them 
uh, you know, be, be more put forth, you know, like to uh, perhaps like Rimouski, like I said, to have Rimouski, it's modern way to write it, but also under, on the same sign, Almoski, the way we say it, I mean, in, in, in the Abenaki language. And also even to the extent in all First Nations language throughout Quebec, where there are toponyms. So the, for the people to get aware of, yeah, well, before French or English, there was there was uh, there were other people before, and then they had a name for that place. So important. yeah, I think we often forget that, don't we? That you often hear arguments about losing place names mm -hmm. if it's English and it's turned into French, and and but we forget that it was already had a name, right? And yeah. and I they, think they that's are, really great. Yeah, there are efforts at the, in Sherbrooke, uh, the Pont des Grandes Fourches. I know they're uh, building a new a new bridge. Uh, the Grand the Grand Fourche, the Pont des Grandes Fourches, uh, and and hoping hopefully the the town uh, of Sherbrooke will have the Abenaki names. Say now Nikitao the book. That's uh, the Great Fourche, Nikitao the book. Fantastic. Uh -huh. I, I have another question on Facebook here from Michael Rice. Um, he was asking if the have the Odenak people considered a community radio to share music language and even a talk show in Abenaki? Uh, we have our community radio. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, um, uh, we share it with uh, uh, Wan Linak and, and uh, Merci, Nicole Yamaska and Bekanko. So it's a joint community radio because uh, we wouldn't have the means to support locally just as a community radio. But hopefully we, we're going to have uh, in a not too far future a, uh, yeah, a little bit of more of history of the language and the songs and to promote uh, Abenaki artists, you know, singers and songwriters. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a dream. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be working on it. You mentioned music there and I'm, I'm a musician and I noticed in the promotional pictures you said there was the, the flying sturgeons. Can you talk a bit about music? I know often music and language are, go together. The learning of one can help the other. And uh, can you talk a bit about maybe mu music, uh, traditional music in, in Odenak? Well, we have, uh, in, our, in our culture, we have uh, the hand drum. Uh, we have also the rattle. Uh, and we used to have a flute. Uh, however, we lost that, that one. But we still use the rattle and the hand drum. And later uh, adopted the big drum, you know, like, uh, like you see from out west. Uh, but I, I started off with Awansi Sakaki 25 years ago. In April, in a couple of weeks, we'll celebra be celebrating 25 years of Awansi Sakaki, means children of the earth. And, and we promote and, and teach and learn and teach our kids because we're, we're at the second generation. I started and now my three daughters and like my cousin and their, their kids are now joined the group and we're teaching the Abenaki uh, songs and, and our songs often accompanied a dance. So that, that's, that's, and, and not all, all of our songs have words and meanings. They're often uh, onomatope sounds, but they often accompanied, like I said, a dance, but some, some do like have words like, Yawuda, Yawuda means four times. So in that song, Yawuda, we sing it four times. Yawuda, heya, 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 Yawuda. The heya, heya, Yawuda. Heya, heya, that's a no battle people. But Yawuda means four times. But uh, we have we have uh, songs like that that were, uh, I guess, composed with words. We have uh, today what we, we call our national anthem. Uh, the we go down more that. Uh, actually, that's one real old Abenaki song. It was probably uh, in seventeen fifteen to seventeen thirty. It was composed by Father Aubry, one of our missionary. We go down more that. Que zonkman sazus, que zonkman. We go down more that. Que zonkman. We go down more that. Que zonkman. Na sazus kize al no bau. What it means is, let's rejoice our our chief or our Lord Jesus Christ is born. Is actually a song 
in honor of Jesus Christ born. That's a Christmas uh, cantic uh, that we originally sang at the Christmas mass. But today we, everybody, everybody in Northern Act knows we go down with that. But we sing it at every event. And at the closing of our powwows, at our funerals, you know, it became a national anthem. But we have different songs like that. Really, really old song, like Nawa, like Mali Nega Wisna. So, so, uh, and so we have, we have those, but, but we're trying to, with the flying sturgeon and I want Saka kick, uh, we sing for sure. That's a given, sing our old and traditional songs, but we've, through the years, we have uh, composed new songs and uh, we're, we're trying our best to, uh, to uh, get more, even more new songs uh, with, the learning of the language more and put in more words than onomatope or sounds. So, uh, but that's a challenge. That's, uh, that's not, that, not that so easy. You mentioned the poetry piece earlier. I guess that might tie in a little bit. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's good. Well, I, I don't see any other questions on uh, Zoom. Uh, Glenn, anything else? Let me hop else? over quickly. Um, well, Bern de Gonzag said uh, he knew Cecile and she was a lovely woman and so knowledgeable. So lots mm -hmm. of great comments on Facebook, everyone uh, too. So thank you for those. But yeah, there's no more questions I see there. Okay, that's great. Well, I think Daniel will, will bring the session to a close, but I want to thank you so much for telling us about this magnificent complicated language uh, and it's just so wonderful to hear about its revival and and you know you had me worried at the beginning of your talk when you said there was like three or four people left who could speak it and mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's the, the same now I don't have that sense I think there's more people that know there's how many there's only one now left but, one. but yeah yeah well the other ones died in the recent uh, last couple of years but yeah yeah uh, I, I have to adjust my presentation now because now it's it's obsolete. But now we only have one, and she cannot Jeez. speak anymore. She's oh no, okay. Yeah, she's she's ninety, but uh, she can't speak. Period. I mean, so yeah, she's mute now. But but no, yeah. Uh, but 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 I could say about fifteen to twenty of us uh, have a, a, a enough baggage to uh, you know sustain a small talk. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's yeah. marvelous. It's it's mm -hmm. you know, thank goodness. It's wonderful to hear. And uh, I just thank you so much. And so we're all so honored to have have learned some. I don't know if we learned the words, but it was fascinating to to hear you speak them. And uh, I tried when my I was muted to say some of the words back to the camera. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to actually put Daniel's um, information up on uh, what's called this Quan Speakers Bureau. Mm -hmm. And so you can find his email address, uh, his, his office uh, um, at the band council. If you want to contact him for more information uh, for other people in the community, uh, that sort of thing, he can be a, 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 a person with information. He knows what he's talking about and who, who to send you to. So we're going to put that up for you on Quan's website. And uh, so thank you for that, Daniel, because that will be very helpful for people that would like to know more about the Abenaki culture and its history, its language. And perhaps there's a few new uh, uh, people out here that have been listening today that would be interested in learning the language. And uh, so they can contact you there to find out how to, to join you on Zoom for, for a language lesson. That's really fantastic. So Yeah, it's, it's free. And, and because of uh, we get this, the grants from Heritage Canada, it's open to everyone. Yeah, and that's really so important too, eh? To keep the mm -hmm. language going and connecting yeah. and uh, make connecting the dots to the younger generation too. It's fantastic. So, 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 so thank we. you so much. So we. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, for the rest of you, if you uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight too. And our next presentation is actually coming right up on Sunday uh, this week, and we're going to hear from Sabrina Gamache Mercurio, who's representing the Fondation Francois Lamy, located on Ile d'Orléans, on Sunday, March 27th, from at one o'clock, and she's going to tell us about this interesting organization that uh, preserves the history of Ile d'Orléans, but makes English-speaking connections as well. So that that's at one o'clock on Sunday. Uh, so thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. 
Uh, thank you, Glenn and Master Control for always keeping everything running smoothly. And until next time, thank you and good night. Adios.